This is a meeting of the TARP Financial Services and Bailouts of Public and Private Programs. The hearing is entitled The State and Municipal Debt, the Coming Crisis. At the beginning of this hearing, as I do with all subcommittee hearings, I read the mission statement of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. So that is what I will do now. The Oversight Committee mission statement. We exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers, because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission statement of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. With that, I will recognize myself for five minutes uh, for an opening statement. This hearing is the second installment of the subcommittee's efforts to examine the causes and severity of fiscal problems facing states and municipalities. Today we will explore the magnitude and the growing budget liability of states and municipalities and its origins. From years of unwise fiscal policy to reckless management and collusion between elected officials and the public sector unions, the crisis has emerged as a great expense to the American people. It also has an impact on our markets. It also has an impact on people's savings, uh, especially for retirement. Leading economists have already labeled 2012 as the State's most difficult budget year on record. Forty-four States and the District of Columbia are now projecting aggregate budget shortfalls totaling $125 billion this year alone. And it only gets worse each year. Even more threatening is the $3.2 trillion in unfunded State pension liabilities and another $383 billion liability for local governments. To be sure, the budget crunch is closely associated with the larger economic stresses facing the country. But years of unchecked spending and overly generous benefits have taken their toll. There are $3 trillion in municipal bonds outstanding across the country, and many State and municipal governments face the real possibility of defaulting on their debt. Ultimately, this hearing is about two things. First is the real bur uh, debt burden facing States and may I restate? First, the, what is the real debt burden facing States and municipalities? And second, what must be done to mitigate the immediate crisis and put these governments back on solvent fiscal paths? But let me restate for the record what I said in Part 1 of this hearing back on February 9th. The era of the bailout is over. Let me repeat, taxpayer bailouts are not on the table. The past two and a half years of wasteful spend spending and irresponsible policy under the guise of economic stimulus and emergency economic stabilization have emptied the Treasury of every thin penny. And even if Washington had more money to spread around, a bailout would only serve to delay the coming day of judgment, pushing our children and grandchildren uh, pushing on them the burden of paying for our irresponsible spending. There must be other options, and this series, this series of hearings is about assessing those options, first understanding the problem and assessing our options to move forward. Some States are making bold efforts at reform. In 2009, for instance, the State of Utah experienced such massive losses due to the market collapse that taxpayer contributions to government workers' pensions would have to rise to $420 million annually to keep them afloat. Senator Dan Lillenquist, however, successfully championed a plan to reform, uh, uh, for reform that will allow the State to remain solvent and enjoy greater budget flexibility. Senator Lillenquist, thank you for being here today. I look forward to your comments. At the executive level, gov governors like uh, Chris Christie of New Jersey and John Kasich of Ohio have begun to push uh, piece by piece legislation to reform their pension plans gradually, while still others like the State of Wisconsin, for instance, have become the proving grounds uh, for the future. Uh, last week, Governor Scott Walker made good on his promise to Wisconsin voters to overhaul the entire structure of public sector unions in the State. That is a bit of controversy, of course. Even the President has commented upon that. Governor Walker's legislation has met with great resistance, but fomenting political chaos will not 
help to serve or fix this fiscal crisis. The question before us today, they require careful, sober consideration, and it is critical and critically important that Congress examine the State and Municipal Fiscal Crisis and to judiciously evaluate uh, reasonable policy options. Today's witnesses are all experts in that field, and uh, the subcommittee will give them an attentive hear, uh, ear. Uh, and with that, I yield for five minutes to the Ranking mem Member, Mr. Quigley of Illinois. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. And uh, before I begin, I ask unanimous consent to uh, have a statement from the National Education Association be entered into the record. Without objection. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I would like to thank you for convening today's hearing, the second hearing on State and Municipal Debt. I would also like to thank our five witnesses for contributing their time and expertise. In fiscal year 2012, 44 States are projected to have a budget deficit of at least 5 percent. Although troubling, this is a short-term fiscal problem that has more to do with the current economic downturn than with underfunded pension programs. Once the economy gets going, State revenues will go up and budget deficits will shrink. In the long term, however, <clears throat> we have an accounting problem unique to six to eight States, among them Illinois, California, Ohio, and New Jersey. For years, under both Republican and Democratic leadership, these States have grossly underfunded their pension programs. No one has to tell me there is a problem. I am from Illinois. Illinois is one of the worst examples, with a $162 billion unfunded liability. Its pension system is less than 50 percent underfunded. This level of underfunding is reflected in Illinois' bond rating. In the last five years, its bond rating has taken a nosedive. Before it raised taxes, an outcome nobody wanted, its bonds were considered only slightly less risky than Iraq's. Its bond rating is still poor, <clears throat> and that means it is much more expensive for Illinois to, Illinois to borrow money. According to Lawrence Massal of the Civic Federation, bad bond ratings were costing Illinois taxpayers $551 million extra per year in interest payments. States like these need to take common sense steps to shore up their pension systems. Reform is important not only to protect taxpayers, but also to protect the beneficiaries of public sector pensions. These pension systems provide retirement security for millions of government workers, and we have a responsibility to ensure that we are not shortchanging them. Pension reform should restore long-term solvency to pension systems so that workers can depend on a steady retirement income. We can keep defined benefit plans while taking reasonable steps like increasing worker contributions and realigning retirement age, COLAs, and term of service. In some States like Illinois, pension reform will have to go farther than in others. What we have to avoid is a one-size-fits-all approach that doesn't distinguish between the bad apples and the good. And we also have to remember that the onus must be on State governments to reform themselves. One model for troubled States might be the recent series of pension reforms in Massachusetts. Under, government, <clears throat> under Governor Deval Patrick, Massachusetts has passed several pension reform packages. Just earlier this year in January, the Governor proposed eight reforms that would improve the long-term sustainability of the State's pension system. Officials have estimated that these reforms will save Massachusetts billions of dollars over the next 30 years. They are also an important step toward a higher bond rating and lower borrowing cost. On February 8th, the bond buyer reported that Standard & Poor's revised Massachusetts outlook to positive from stable, based on strong management practices. Of course, every State and municipality is different, and pension reform would have to be tailored to each specific situation. Still, the Massachusetts example demonstrates that pension reform can be achieved not only <clears throat> that not only increases bond ratings, but decreases borrowing costs. That also protects workers and guarantees them a steady retirement income. I thank the Chairman and I yield back. I thank the Ranking Member and I uh, certainly appreciate the panel for being here today. Um, members will have seven days to submit opening statements for the record and we will recognize the panel now. Uh, I will introduce the whole panel, then we will begin with you, Senator Lillenquist, to, to uh, give your opening statement. Uh, the Honorable Dan Lillenquist is a member of the Utah State Senate. Mr. Uh, uh, Robert Curter, I'm sorry, I'm bouncing around. Sorry, is the managing director for U.S. State and Regional Ratings at Moody's. Uh, 
Mr. Dean Baker is co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research. Thank you, Mr. Baker. Uh, Dr. Baker, I am sorry. Um, Ms. Robin Prunty is the team leader for state ratings at Standard & Poor's. And Mr. Andrew Biggs is a resident, scholarship, uh, resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy Research. It is a policy of the committee that all witnesses be sworn in before they testify. So if you will please rise and raise your right hand. <coughs> Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? All right. You may be seated. Let, uh, let the record reflect that all the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Um, now, in order for us to have time for discussion, we, we do have votes on the floor um, in less than an hour. So if you could keep your comments to five minutes, uh, the, the clock will uh, register for you, as you can see. Uh, with one minute remaining, it moves from green to yellow. That means hurry on up and finish. And any time that you don't use is really a gift. So uh, if you can summarize your statements, we will also let you uh, uh, offer your statements, full statements, for the record. Uh, and with that, Senator Lillenquist, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Quigley, and members of the committee. It is an honor to be with you today. Um, if there is an upside of an economic downturn, it is that taxpayers throughout the United States are waking up to the massive liabilities incurred by State and local governments. In particular, fi financial commitments made to public employees are driving policy debates throughout this country. Defined, benefits, uh, def defined benefit pensions are at the heart of these policy debates as policymakers wrestle with the approximately $3 trillion unfunded pension liabilities. For years, public employee pension plans have largely been exempted from taxpayer scrutiny because of the long-term nature of pension commitments and the assumption that today's market losses will be made up by tomorrow's gains. However, the market crash of 2008 revealed just how much market risk tax taxpayers are bearing to guarantee pension benefits for public employees. Utah's pension system is a case in point. If I might, I would like to spend a couple of minutes discussing the situation in Utah. Going into 2008, Utah's public pe employees' pension systems were over 100 percent funded. Utah has always paid the full required actuarial contribution to its pension systems and has not raised retirement benefits for over 20 years. Utah's retirement system ha had been and still is recognized as one of the best run pension systems in the country. However, market losses in 2008 blew a 30 percent hole in Utah's pension fund, opening up a $6.5 billion unfunded liability. To put this number in perspective for the State of Utah, our constitutional debt limit is, is set at 1.5 percent of the total assessed value of real property in the State. That value is, set, is currently $4.4 billion, and we have borrowed $3.3 billion of that $4.4 billion, or approximately 75 percent. Adding Utah's official debt to Utah's newly recognized unfunded pension, pension liabilities, Utah's total debt is $9.8 billion, which is 223 percent of Utah's constitutional debt limit. In the fall of 2009, Utah's Joint Retirement and Independent Entities Subappropriations Committee, of which I am the Senate co-chair, requested an in-depth actuarial review of Utah's pension liabilities. For the first time in our state, we asked our actuaries, instead of looking in the rearview mirror, to look forward for 40 years and assess a variety of scenarios to give us a better understanding of where we are going. The report highlighted some troubling facts. First, we realized that Utah, and I would say any other state, if you look forward, cannot grow away out, its way out of these pension problems. We would have to average in Utah 13 percent returns year over year for 20 years to grow out of the 2008 losses. If Utah's pension system averages its assumed seven and three quarters rate of return and we do nothing else, Utah's pension system will be bankrupt by approximately 2040. Second, we realize Utah must dramatically increase contributions to the pension systems required to compensate for the 2008 losses. And these contributions will increase and continue to increase over the coming years and stay there. 
for our amortization period, which is 25 years. Our total contributions will equate to approximately 10 percent of Utah's general and education funds for 25 years to pay off one year's worth of losses. Finally, we, the study from our, our actuary showed that Utah can absor cannot absorb another year like 2008. For, for example, if we hit a 6 percent return over the next 25 years, we are bankrupt now as a State and don't know it because we are hoping that we can get the market returns we need to meet the commitments we have made to our employees. Last year, the Utah Legislature acted, acted aggressively to cap its existing pension liabilities. We closed our defined benefit pension plans to new enrollees, created a new retirement system for new public employees after, hired after July 1, 2011. The crux of our pension reforms are that the State will no longer have an open-ended guarantee to its public employees. Instead, we are saying affirmatively we will put a certain amount towards retirement, and that is what you get. Now, employees have the option to choose between a 401k style plan and also a defined benefit pension hybrid plan, but they are on the hook for the market risk. It is our hope as the State of Utah, as we have tried to manage our liabilities and risk, that other States will follow suit. It is now time to act and make sure we are containing these liabilities so we can move forward as a State and as a country. Thank you. Ms. Prunty. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, members of the committee, good afternoon. My name is Robin Prunty and I am a Managing Director in Standard & Poor's service, Rating Services business. I am an analytic manager in charge of the State Ratings Group. Standard & Poor's is a credit rating agency and as such conducts analysis and forms forward-looking opinions about the creditworthiness of debt and debt issuers, including, among other States and municipalities. And I am pleased to appear before you today. Standard & Poor's believes that the difficulties faced by States and municipalities will give rise to very difficult budget and policy decisions, but not default for our rated universe in the overwhelming majority of cases. This is because State and municipal debt obligations are secured either by a specific pledge of the government's full taxing authority or dedicated taxes, user revenues or fees, and there is often a priority status for uh, debt relative to other obligations. Because States and, in many cases, local governments are required to balance their budgets rather than finance budget deficits solely through debt issuance, they are annually making choices to align revenues and expenditures. These actions, along with the Federal stimulus funding, contributed to relative credit stability for most U.S. public finance uh, issuers. While credit downgrades have increased over the last two years, and we expect there could be further credit deterioration in 2011, in the majority of cases, we believe that general obligation and other types of direct debts of State and local governments we rate will continue to be retired as scheduled. Over the past 25 years, there have been 42 defaults uh, for non-housing issues in U.S. public finance at Standard & Poor's. This is, there has been one observed default by a State in more than 100 years. Although the number of defaults has been, relatively speaking, low, we do believe that securities issued by rated governments can still face meaningful default risk. Because of the slow progress of the recovery from the recession, S&P believes that the continued flat or slow revenue growth uh, trends for State and local governments may add to strain on budgets and overall liquidity, especially in the short term as Federal stimulus funds end. In addition, we believe that pensions and other post-employment benefit obligations represent material long-term risk to governments and have long been factored into our criteria for rating State and local governments. Recent investment performance of the assets in most pension trust funds is well below historic trends and negative in many cases, which has contributed to weakened pension funding levels. Govern governments that are not funding their annual required contributions risk the most significant changes in their budget capacity in the future. Such concerns have given rise to pension reform movements in certain States, and we expect that this will continue. While we believe that liabilities to public employees represent genuine long-term pressures on government credit quality, they generally are not immediately competing for most governments' capacity to fund their debt service or meet other priority payment obligations. In general, we believe that the worst-case scenarios regarding pensions will likely occur only if governments are unable or unwilling to use their powers of adjustment. 
Notwithstanding the difficult policy choices facing uh, State and local governments, S&P continues to expect that most issuers that we rate will continue to retain their strong capacity and willingness to meet their debt obligations. Moreover, there is little incentive for them to allow their debt obligations to default. This is in part because we believe that a defaulted debt service payment would likely result in a loss of access to the capital markets, which has been a significant source of funding for capital and infrastructure projects uh, for both State and local governments. We have observed that governments have made many improvements to their budget structure, reserve policies, and debt management during prior periods of budget stress, which in our view has generally enhanced their ability to manage through downturns. Reconciliation of structural revenue and expenditure misalignments may not be achieved in one fiscal year, but reform efforts are underway and for many governments, and we expect that this will continue through 2011. Effective financial management will be key to addressing these challenges, and governments have strong powers of adjustment. If governments do not manage or make adjustments and instead rely heavily on debt and other one-time solutions in the hope that economic growth will balance their budgets, we believe that they could be setting themselves up for greater hardship in the near term. Throughout difficult economic periods, including during and after this most recent recession, we have generally seen on the part of governments what we consider to be a very strong commitment to their debt obligations, which for us has been an important credit consideration over time. While there are vulnerabilities in the public sector, public finance sector, our expectation is that the threat of default is generally not widespread among State and municipal issuers that we rate. I thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in this hearing and would be happy to answer questions that you may have. Thank you, Ms. Prunty. That was uh, probably the most amazing use of time. Well done. Thank you. Dr. Baker. Thank you, Chairman McHenry and uh, Ranking Member Quigley. I want to thank, in particular, uh, Representative Quigley. I am also from Illinois, and my mother is one of those public employees who is dependent on the pensions there, so I appreciate your concern. I want to make three main points in my comments today. Uh, first off, that the financial strain facing State and local governments is, is first and foremost originates in Washington, and perhaps I should say Wall Street. It is a problem of the economy, and that is where most of uh, the difficulties stem from. <laughs> Secondly, that the problems that our pension funds face are manageable. And the third point is that the pension fund accounting is for the most part reasonable, that they are looking at expected returns on their pension funds, requiring pension funds to use a risk-free rate of return in assessing their, their, their funds could lead to higher costs and possibly ending uh, defined benefit plans altogether, which I would argue would mean higher costs for taxpayers. First point, um, the fact that the problems originate in Washington should be fairly straightforward. Um, we are three years, two months into a recession. The unemployment rate is still 4.5 percentage points higher than it was prior to the downturn. If we compare that to the last serious recession, 81-82, we already were back at the pre-recession pre level of unemployment. It is reasonable to expect State and local governments to prepare for downturns but this is an extraordinary one without precedence. This was due to mismanagement here in Washington at the Federal Reserve Board, irresponsibility on Wall Street. This was not, not your run-of-the-mill recession. And just an idea of how much difference that makes, we are currently 6 percent below potential GDP. If we assume that State revenues were 6 percent higher, a good first approximation, most of these States would have no problems at all balancing their budget. In the case of Wisconsin, which of course has been in the news lately, they would have $4 billion in additional revenue over their two-year horizon, fully making up their shortfall before even taking account the, the savings on expenditures for programs like unemployment insurance, TANF, and other expenditures that have increased during the downturn. So this is first and foremost a problem that originates in Washington, not to say that all governments were responsible, but certainly the problems were enormously worsened by the severity of the downturn. The second point, there, oftentimes we scare people by using big numbers. The pension liabilities, however estimated, are very big numbers. But if we calculate them relative to the size of the future economy over a 30-year period, the normal horizon, we are looking at a shortfall that, by my calculations, is a little more than two-tenths of a percent of GDP. That is hardly trivial. But if we compare that, say, to the increase in defense spending from 2000 to 2011, that was 1.7 percentage points of GDP. So the amount of additional revenue, whether through tax increases or reduction of other spending, is about one-eighth as much as we found to increase our defense spending, defense budget, between 2000 and the present. Not to say that is trivial, but that it is very much a manageable sum. The last point I will make is that I would say that the the pension funds are using appropriate accounting 
They are using expected values. And I will say that I have been a critic of their accounting in years past. In, in, in the 90s, in the, early, in the 2000s, when you had very high price to earnings ratios, they were making assumptions about future stock returns that were clearly unrealistic, and I said that quite openly at the time. Now that you have had a big fall in the stock market, going forward, the, price to earn, the given current price to earnings ratios and given growth projections from the Congressional Budget Office and other major forecasters, their assumptions on rates of return are very realistic. The alternative, if we were to insist that pension funds use a risk-free rate of return, we would have two stories we could tell. One is that they continue to invest in equities, but they assume a risk-free rate of return. This would, in effect, require prefunding. This would be very perverse policy. It would mean more taxes or less spending in the current to have savings in the future. We might think that prudent in some sense, but I don't know if anyone has recommended prefunding schools, prefunding fire departments. That is not ordinarily the way we expect our, our, our governments to function. The alternative is to say, okay, they would just invest in bonds and get the lower risk-free rate of return. If we did that, pension funds would be more costly to State and local governments, which would mean a higher burden to taxpayers. The final possibility is we could end up eliminating them altogether, which, as we know, some States have done, some local governments have done. This, again, is a cost to taxpayers if we think this through carefully. Defined benefit pensions are something that workers value greatly. The fact is that State and local governments can endure timing risk with the stock market because they are essentially infinitely lived individual entities. Individuals, of course, have finite lives. For individuals, it is a very, very big risk. By virtue of taking that risk, we are able to get either better employees for the same wages or the same employees for lower wages. That is a benefit that workers get in exchange for other compensation. If State and local governments no longer take advantage of their difference, indifference to risk, they end up losing that benefit, and that will cost taxpayers more money. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Baker. Uh, Mr. Kerter? Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Um, Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Congressman Quigley, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Robert Kerter. I am a managing director in the U.S. Public Finance Group at Moody's Investor Service. I want to thank you for inviting Moody's to share our views as part of today's hearings. My comments will focus on the credit risk of public finance bonds that are rated by Moody's. A significant number of public finance bonds are not rated by Moody's or any other rating agency. Because unrated issuers and bonds may have quite different character risk characteristics than rated ones, my comments should not be generalized to the entire universe of public finance bonds. I also want to be clear that Moody's opinions in this sector speak only to the likelihood that a government-issued bond is likely to be paid in full and on a timely basis. While we take into account all of an issuer's major financial obligations, we do so in order to assess the likelihood that an issuer can and is willing to meet its payment obligations to bond investors. This means that when we use the term default, we are referring specifically to the failure to make payments to bondholders and not a failure to fulfill any other obligations a State or local government may have, such as utility payments, salaries due to employees, or pension liabilities. I will turn now to our views on the sector. All of us here today know that State and local governments are experiencing unprecedented financial strain. This is reflected in the negative outlooks Moody's has had on all major subsectors in this market. For State and local governments, our negative views are driven by four main factors. First, the overall economy is still fragile, even though it is recovering. Second, State and local governments are facing increased liabilities, such as pension and health care costs. Many commentators have recently focused on pension liabilities. Moody's has long factored these liabilities into our analysis and opinions. Growing unfunded pension obligations are creating challenges for these issuers, and we are monitoring the situation closely. We have taken and will continue to take rating actions where we, we believe an issuer's credit profile warrants it. Third, lingering fiscal pressures have required State and local governments to make severe budget cuts, use budget reserves, and pursue other nonrecurring solutions to solve their budget gaps. And finally, revenue sources are strained due to persistent high unemployment, sagging real estate prices, which lead to drags on taxes. Let me focus now specifically on the condition of the U.S. States. Most States are facing challenges with respect to both their liabilities and revenues. The recovery is still fragile, unemployment is very high, and it is uncertain when sustained revenue growth will take hold. That said, 
Moody's does not see bondholder debt as a source of credit strain for most States. This is because annual bond debt service costs remain a relatively small share of overall expenditures. In addition, most States do not face refinancing or material rollover risks. We believe that we could see a few more States turn to deficit financings to fund operating expenses or restructurings to produce budget savings in 2011, but we expect those States to be the exception rather than the rule. For these reasons, and because of the strong incentives they have to pay their bond debt, we believe it is very unlikely that any States will default on their bond obligations in the next 12 to 18 months. In the local government sector rated by Moody's, we see unprecedented financial strain for the reasons I mentioned earlier. Further, the States can shift some costs to the local government level, which is likely to exacerbate the challenges there. However, we also expect that a majority of the individual local governments will make the tough decisions and the budget cuts needed to continue to make timely payments on their bonds. We do not expect widespread defaults by rated State and local governments. However, there have been situations in the past where the risk of default seemed imminent, even though it was ultimately averted. We saw this, for example, in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. We expect there will be some additional cases of severe credit stress going forward. In summary, there is substantial credit pressure on the U.S. public finance sector today. Over the next 12 to 18 months, we believe it is unlikely that any State will default on its obligations to bond investors, and we believe the increase in bond defaults among local governments will be relatively small. Thank you again for inviting me to testify on this important matter, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. Kerter. Dr. Biggs? Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Quigley, and members of the Committee, thank you for offering me the opportunity to testify with regard to State and municipal finances and the role that public pension financing may play. It is my hope that State and local finances will avoid a severe disruption. Like a plane buffeted by turbulence, they will survive so long as they had sufficient altitude before the event. My greatest concern is not so much for this recession as the next one, which inevitably will come. If we enter that one in a precarious financial position, State and local governments may not have sufficient room to maneuver. The rising costs of public sector pensions, while not the main driver of State and local financial problems, have gained increasing prominence in recent months. My work on public pension financing argues that if we wish to strengthen State and local government finances, we need an accurate assessment of the size of pension liabilities and the steps that will and won't help the governments reduce them. Current pension accounting methods unequivocally fail on this front. To be clear, the so-called market valuation critique of pension financing is not a criticism of the average returns that plans project for their investments. It does not say, for instance, that pension funds will yield 7 percent on average rather than the 8 percent average they claim. Rather, it says that because this 8 percent is a risky return, it is inappropriate to use that interest rate in valuing benefit liabilities that are guaranteed by State law or constitutions. Pension's current practice of discounting guaranteed liabilities using returns on risky assets runs counter to economic theory, the practice of financial markets, and the accounting standards imposed on private sector pension plans. As the Vice Chairman of the Federal Reserve put it, quote, while economists are famous for disagreeing with each other on virtually every other conceivable issue, when it comes to this one there is no professional disagreement. The only appropriate way to calculate the present value of a very low risk liability is to use a very low risk discount rate, end quote. Most economists believe that since pension benefits are guaranteed by governments, it is appropriate to discount them using interest rates derived from other government guaranteed investments, namely Treasury bonds. Using an appropriate discount rate, current unfunded pension liabilities are not $500 billion as claimed, but over $3 trillion. Violating this rule, as public pension accounting does, leads to nonsensical results. For instance, public pensions could erase all their reported deficits and even generate a surplus if only they were to shift all their investments to stocks and assume a 10 percent rate of return. Note that plans' actual benefit liabilities would be the same and the market value of their assets would be the same, but by adopting a more aggressive funding strategy and ignoring the risks of that strategy, they could magically generate $500 billion at the stroke of a pen. If this seems to make, sense, if this seems to make no sense, it is because it does make no sense. But even today, after the financial crisis and the market meltdown, many public sector pensions are effectively doubling down on risk. Having already doubled the share of their assets going to stocks since the mid-1980s, public sector pensions are now the largest single investor in hedge funds and are also moving into private equity. 
there is no coherent funding strategy that would use these assets to fund fixed guaranteed benefit liabilities. This is particularly so when you note that the public sector pensions operate under a standard called interperiod equity, which dictates that every year a plan should fully fund the benefits earned in that year and not pass on liabilities to future taxpayers. But when you fund a guaranteed benefit using highly risky assets, it is obvious that you are passing significant contingent liabilities onto the future generations. And the more risk you take, the larger these liabilities are. Using discount rates that economists deem appropriate, public pension unfunded liabilities are somewhere over $3 trillion. The only way to reduce these unfunded liabilities would be to actually fund them. Most States currently devote 3 to 4 percent of their budgets to pension funding. Using more accurate accounting, that would rise to over 10 percent. In some States, significantly more so. Simply taking more investment risk won't do the trick, nor should it. We face difficult choices, but on one thing we should be clear. It is more important to get the numbers right before you have a crisis, when you still have time to do something about it, than to wait until a crisis has hit. It would be a sad irony if, even as we recover from a financial crisis driven by lax accounting and excessive risk-taking, that we lurched into a new one driven by the same causes. Thank you very much. Certainly appreciate your testimony, and I will recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Carter, in your testimony, you affirm that combining both debt and pension metrics um, will improve transparency for investors. Um, can you please name specific measures that uh, States can adopt to enhance transparency? Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we published a report uh, recently um, uh, combining debt and pension metrics into one metric. Uh, for purposes of um, providing increased transparency to the marketplace for uh, purposes of uh, evaluating credit risk. Um, we did that because uh, we were trying to conform with practices in other business lines, the way corporations are, are looked at in hospitals. Um, our goal is improve transparency for the investors who rely on our ratings. Um, what specifically could States do? I mean, in terms of public policy, what can we do to enhance disclosures for investors? Yeah, um, we, don't really, we don't advise or make recommendations. Okay. Then if that is your answer, that is your answer. Um, uh, Ms. Prunty, would you answer the same question? We turn on your microphone. Yes. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, looked at pension liabilities as part of our criteria for um, many decades. And I think that the challenge when you look at public uh, plans is that they, the current governmental accounting standards allow for a range of actuarial assumptions uh, when they are calculating those liabilities. So it is very difficult to do an apples-to-apples -apples comparison among States and among local governments as well. Uh, so, you know, we do report those liabilities and have uh, reported those alongside debt and give them equal weighting uh, when we are evaluating the debt and liability profile. But I think that some of the variability in the actuarial assumptions that are allowed uh, definitely make it challenging to do that kind of comparison. Would uniform disclosures assist in, in credit rating and transparency for investors? Well, I think that there is current uh, efforts underway with the Governmental Accounting Standards Board to look at that issue, and we are obviously watching that closely. There are a lot of unique features as you go from plan to plan. They are not uniform plans, uh, government by government. So I think that um, the uh, one-size-fits-all solution is uh, probably a little bit challenging there, but um, certainly uh, a little more uniformity would make it easier to make comparisons across um, governments. Mr. Kerr? Uh, would un uniformity assist? Uh, in uh, yes, we, we are in favor of more uniformity and consistency and transparency across the marketplace in terms of reporting this information. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, in in comparison in, in a comparison to the corporate bond market to the muni bond market, uh, is there more disclosure in the corporate bond market than in the muni bond market, Ms. Pronti? Well, we, when we are assigning ratings, we uh, are generally um, relying on the information provided by issuers, and we, you know, based on our criteria, are assuming that. Um, well, actually, if you if you don't want to answer the question, it's fine. I don't have much time. Um, is there more 
disclosure and more transparency in the corporate bond market than the municipal bond market? Yes or no? Like, which yeah, one? Yeah, I've been in public finance my entire uh, tenure at S and P, so I don't. I'm not familiar with the corporate. Mr. Kerter. Um, generally, disclosure or pension disclosure, Mr. Chairman. Both. Both. Um, or either. Whatever you'd like to answer. I'm just trying to get an answer from you guys. Yeah. Um, uh, and this is a beef. I've got to be honest with you. This is a beef with the credit rating agencies, is you guys talk around the problem and actually not address it. This is sort of the frustration that many of us have, and I think the marketplace has with this. Mr. Carter? Uh, yes. Uh, in um, corporate disclosure, uh, generally, there is interim financial reporting and other uh, types of uh, more timely reporting. Uh, municipal disclosure, the audits are typically you know, often late and there is no interim financial reporting. That said, I think it is important to recognize that in the public finance marketplace there are many uh, resources of publicly available information that are not available in the corporate uh, world, uh, budget information, revenue reporting, things that uh, are publicly available as a consequence of the budgeting process. Sure. Um, in terms of uh, what has happened in Ohio, According to municipal bond strategists, upon the recent passage of Ohio State Union reform legislation, the cost of borrowing reflected uh, by the yield of the State's long-term general obligation bonds fell by, any, uh, uh, by a meaningful percentage um, and dropped the cost of borrowing for Ohio post passage of, of this union reform legislation, basically the collective bargaining agreement. Uh, can, Mr. Carter, can you touch on this? Would you be willing to touch on that? Um, you know, the existence or nonexistence of a collective bargaining is not in and of itself determinative of budget balance or uh, the likelihood that an entity will inquire, acquire large uh, unfunded liabilities or large um, uh, post-retirement liabilities. From our perspective, we look at the bottom line. It is not how the budget is, uh, it is whether the budget is balanced rather than how the budget is balanced. But it had a meaningful effect in the marketplace, though it didn't create the uh, uh, change the rating. It did change the rate that people were paying, uh, that the state was paying. Um, I, I, I don't track the pricing, so uh, I trust that that's correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, with that, I yield. Uh, well, I recognize Mr. Quigley for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Uh, Baker, you're a little more optimistic on the overall picture than than some, and. On the overall picture, that is probably accurate. W wouldn't you concede that for six to eight states and the pension issue it is far more acute a problem and far more dramatic action has to be taken? Well, thank you, uh, Ranking Member Quigley. I am usually not known for my optimism. But um, you certainly do have several states, uh, the ones you had mentioned uh, on that list, that clearly have more serious problems. We have a number of states that, had we not gone into the downturn, their pensions would be pretty much fully funded. We had other states that faced problems even prior to the downturn, and certainly the situation was made considerably worse by the downturn. And as you know, in your, your own state, Illinois, of course, they did have a substantial tax increase in part to deal with those problems. I suspect you will see comparable actions in other states. But, but is that enough? I mean, even Illinois is still borrowing a significant amount of money to, <clears throat> to meet those obligations. Is, are you suggesting, with all due respect, that it can all be made up for with additional revenue? Well, I don't mean to tell the States how they should deal with their shortfalls, but I will say one thing that is front and center is the state of the national economy. If it were the case that we were somewhere near full employment today, Illinois and every other State would see both a much better overall budget situation and, as well, its pensions would likely look better, both because there would be more money flowing into it, regular, regular money flowing into it, and then on top of that I would anticipate the stock market moving back towards more normal levels. Well, if, if we believe in collective bargaining, we should also believe in collectively solving the problems. I, I guess what I am trying to get you to is that it is not just the economy or additional revenues. There has to be some meeting in the middle. I mean, at least some of these pensions, you would agree, have been a little too generous, a little too uh, out of sync with actuarials in terms of when people start collecting, how long they collect, how long they pay in, the COLAs that are involved. Well, a couple of points I would make on that. Pensions are part of an overall compensation package. And there have been a number of studies. We have done some at my center. A number of other organizations around the country, academics, have done studies looking at public sector compensation in general. 
the conclusion of the bulk of these studies, I know Dr. Biggs is opposite conclusions, but the conclusion of the bulk of these studies is that public sector workers are paid a little less, taking into account their, their pension commitments than, than uh, private, private sector workers adjusted for education. Now, having said that, are there cases where I think pensions are inappropriate, where you know, maybe workers are allowed to retire too early, where they are perhaps structured inappropriately? It is common for pensions to be based on just the last three years, sometimes just the last one year. I wouldn't do it that way. But again, I am not setting the laws for State pensions. I agree. Uh, we are both in that situation. Uh, Ms. Prunty and Ms. Mr. Kerter, um, you seem fairly confident that we are not in for a major default in the next year or so. But um, stranger things have happened when the experts haven't picked up. The issue that I am most concerned with is the impact on the market as a whole, even just the bond market. Is there a contagion factor if a major state had a major default? Thank you. Um, we, we do, uh, our current rating would suggest that we, you know, don't see a default for Illinois and actually their bondholder. Or any state. Yeah, or any state. Um, Ohio, or Illinois has actually, over the last year, during last legislative session, put some protections in to ensure that there was sufficient special funds on hand in order to cover future years' uh, debt service obligations, both short and long term, and some, have made some adjustments there in order to, uh, you know, focus on that. Uh, so I think that. But, but the, the question still stands: Given a possibility in this country of a major default, is there a contagion factor, or, or is this all isolated in terms of how you rate funds? I, I think defaults historically, if you look at, uh, you know, New York City back in the 70s, there was a significant uh, focus on the market and the impact there, and I think that's why you see so many oversight uh, mechanisms across states to uh, prevent local governments from uh, being in a default situation for exactly that reason, that they are would be concerned that there would be implications for the broader market. Mr. Carter, quickly. Yes, thank you. Um, the, you know, the markets clearly are very jittery right now. Um, we uh, don't believe there will be major state defaults. Um, we don't believe that there will be uh, more than a few small <coughs> rated defaults among local governments. Um, but clearly the markets are jittery, and uh, any kind of a significant default would uh, add to the nervousness of an already jittery market. Thank you. Gentlemen's time expired. Uh, Ms. Uh, Burkle for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our panelists for uh, being here today. Uh, my district is in upstate New York, so if you'll indulge me for my five minutes, I'd like to talk about uh, the State of New York, and in particular because it is one of those uh, 44 states that Mr. Uh, Chairman spoke of in his opening remarks. Uh, Dr. Biggs, I'd like to just uh, dr direct my question to you, and then and to Mr. Kerter, uh, and then if anyone else would like to comment on it. In 1975, New York City found itself in a crisis and had to make a decision between paying its debt or paying its employees. And as you know, they paid their uh, debt down. Uh, my question is: Do you foresee New York State uh, being in? Uh, facing such a choice within the next five years, and if you could comment on how dire you, you believe the situation is in New York uh, at the present time. Well, I know a little bit about New York State. My, uh, my father is from upstate New York near Schenectady, so I spend a, a bit of time up there. I would not claim to be an expert on, on New York State finances. Certainly, uh, in the recent history has not been encouraging there. Um, New York State's pensions have been better funded than in many states of the country, but that, you know, when you use honest accounting, that is being the top of a very bad heap. Um, but still, the, the other uh, costs the, the, the State uh, government has to deal with are, are pretty significant. I have not followed closely enough the efforts of Governor Cuomo there to try to rein in some of the costs and, and to bring balance to the budget. If those are successful, certainly New York will be in better shape. I think because of New York uh, reliance on, on tax revenue from Wall Street, which is highly cyclical, they have a risk factor there that some other states may not have. So certainly I am hopeful. I am more hopeful now than I was six months ago, but New York State has a long way to go. Thank you. Mr. Kerter. Yes. 
Um, our ratings really speak to whether or not this, we expect the State to make good on an, an, its bond payments in full and on time. Um, uh, that said, of course, uh, the State has had very difficult problems, as all States have, are facing tremendous problems of managing their revenue and spending. Uh, our view is that they, States have revenue and spending problems, but not really debt problems, because even in New York, their debt service is a relatively small portion of their overall spending. Um, right now, of course, uh, because revenue is short, um, uh, payments to the retirement system and all other expenses are competing with each other uh, for scarce dollars, and the State is having to make difficult choices about meeting, balancing their budget within the constraints of uh, weaker revenue. Uh, just you, Senator. quickly add to that that again, just to remind uh, the, the committee that uh, first and foremost, the state of the economy will be the most important factor to determining the ability of New York and every other state to meet its obligations. Thank you, Dr. Baker. Senator. You know, you asked the question whether or not um, New York is in a situation where they need to pay their debt or pay their employees. Utah is in that situation right now. As we ramp into 75 percent increases in our employer contribution for pension systems, that is going to pay for these losses. That is 10 percent of our general fund that will not be available for wages or health care benefits for our employees. We fund things in this order in our State, and I think most States are similar. We fund pension benefits first, health benefits second, and whatever change is left over goes to wage. And our wages in the State have, have fallen behind as we have struggled to keep up with pension and health care costs. And so as we looked at this, um, our reforms, we started calling it maybe euphemistically the Wage Liberation Act, because we said, look, you can't have a set bucket of money and having your benefits eat more and more of that bucket of money. You have no money left for, wa for wage. So we have struggled to get the 24-year-old, uh, you know, at the start of his career because he's looking, he or she is looking for wage and benefits are less important and we struggle to recruit as a State. We think by affirmatively saying, and, and generous, we, we, our legislation says you get 10 percent towards retirement, 10 percent of your wage. If you are public safety or fire, you get 12 percent. So it is a generous amount, but it is set. And that is all we are doing. So hopefully over time, we can repair wages for, our, for our, our employees, which by our data in the State of Utah, their actual wage is lower because we, have, we are making this choice. Do you pay this debt or do you pay the employees? And we are struggling with that right now as a State. Thank you. I yield back my time. Uh, Mr. Welch for five minutes. Uh, five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator, congratulations on uh, your success in making some progress in dealing with this in Utah. You have got to give us the magic uh, potion so we can <laughs> make some progress here. Uh, you know, one of the things we are struggling with is our own deficit, and uh, the new majority is, uh, in my view, rightly focusing on that. But there's consequences to some of the policy decisions we make. Uh, and I just want to ask, uh, I'll start with Dr. Baker, uh, what is the impact on the States uh, in their ability to uh, address among other things, this underfunding of the pension, uh, if we have $100 billion in uh, cuts that include substantial revenues that the States have been uh, depending on? Is there an impact? Well, I would certainly expect there to be an impact. To some extent, uh, these are revenues, as you say, that be committed to the States. But I think probably the bigger impact is that uh, there have been a number of estimates. Uh, Mark Zandi at Moody's and uh, Goldman Sachs came up with estimates that this could lead to losses of many 700,000, 800,000 jobs. This means more people unemployed, slower economic growth, less tax revenue to the States. I think that actually is likely to be the bigger impact due to the impact on the economy than sort of direct impact in terms of cutting money to State governments. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Kurtner, how about you? And again, these are policy choices we have to make. There is not endless money. Uh, we here in Congress. Uh, have, have got to bring us back to fiscal balance. But I also think we have to be clear-eyed about the impact of some of these cuts when it is revenue that goes to the States and then how that impacts their ability to deal with their own fiscal problems. Do you have a comment on that question? Um, states are beginning to face the fiscal dilemmas that they are um, uh, uh, challenged with right now. They are making very difficult spending and revenue cuts, touching programs that in uh, prior years were off limits. Um, these are tough choices elected officials have to make. 
Uh, and with regard to pension obligations, they're also beginning to address some of those issues, too, by increasing employee and employer contributions, as well as addressing the benefit side of the equation. Okay. Ms. Prunty, how about you? Yeah, I think it is fair to say that the budget climate is still very difficult for States, and if there were any reductions in uh, revenue sources, be it Federal or other tax sources, it would be uh, add additional difficulty to the current budget challenges, okay. particularly because Medicaid is a very large portion of State spending, and that is the primary Federal flow of revenue to States. Uh, so, yes. Uh, thank you. And Dr. Uh, Dr. Biggs, uh, I think you made a very compelling point uh, on, in terms of the investment models and what is realistic. Uh, you can't have a pie-in-the-sky uh, kind of uh, uh, projection. But on the other hand, uh, does it, is, is it equally uh, questionable as to whether there should be the so-called risk-free model uh, that imposes what historically I think is a much lower rate of return where there are consequences to State budgets uh, if you have a so-called risk-free model where you can give yourself the uh, perhaps satisfaction that you are, quote, guaranteed to have that return. But on the other hand, there is a consequence uh, with respect to how much then has to be put in to fund it, and it may be more. In sure. Well, I think it, it's, it's important to repeat that the, the use of a, of a riskless or risk-adjusted discount rate is the way you value your liability. It doesn't restrict the plan if it wishes to invest in equities or invest in more risky assets. And the plan will benefit from those investments if they pan out. If, if they invest in stocks and the stocks generate higher returns, then they actually have more assets on hand than they otherwise would have. The objection is to essentially assume that those assets will, will uh, generate 8 percent returns going forward without taking any risk into account. If you go back to the 1980s, up to the mid 1980s. Let me just get clarification, because I think this is quite important. If, if you have a riskless model where you are saying it has to be the T bill rate, let's say, where there is some guarantee, we hope the, the Federal Government is good for it, uh, that can have a depressing impact on the ability of a State to meet many of its other legitimate obligations, including what Senator was talking about, uh, trying to bring up the wage scale. Sure. But if you value your liabilities correctly, the liability is what it is. Mm -hmm. the, the, how you fund a liability is an entirely distinct question from what the liability is. Uh, plans today, state pensions, generally take an aggressive funding strategy, which means they invest in, in stocks, in hedge funds, things like that. The higher expected return means they can make a lower contribution today. And, and people like that. It leaves more money for other things. But because the benefit is guaranteed, it means a higher contingent liability on future taxpayers. Now, that is inconsistent with the standards that GASB lays out that says you should try to fully fund your benefits as they accrue and not pass contingent liabilities. But what we are finding out today, again, going back to the mid-1980s, before then you had a high level of funding into State pensions, but, but uh, conservative investments that go into them. They would invest mostly in bonds and things like that. That meant you had to put a lot of money away, but you didn't have a large contingent liability. Since then, they went more aggressively into stocks, which essentially cut their funding levels in half. And for many years, you had good times. The stocks returned well. They increased benefits. They had funding holidays. Today, we are seeing the flip side of that strategy. So you can't take an aggressive, risky strategy and expect that you are never going to have to deal with the downside. And that is currently hey, what we have. Gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Meehan of Pennsylvania for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And <clears throat> excuse me for a second. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for each of the panelists for your articulation of a lot of details on a very, very uh, challenging uh, issue, certainly for those who, who struggle at the local level. And I often think about these things in the context of municipalities, not just the states where there is a greater capacity to handle these, but a lot of local obligations that have been undertaken for everything from you know, funding local economic development to, to other kinds of programs. And I am thinking about the implications that are going to be sort of bleeding down, particularly as we aren't able to predict yet what states are actually going to be doing with their budgets. But the implication is that much of it is going to be pushed down to the local level as well. I think, Ms. Prunty and Mr. Kurtner, Kurtner you discussed this issue, which I don't clearly understand, which is 
the, the role of accounting in municipal finance, which may be different from what we do with a publicly traded company, can you, and, and, and the fact that we may be understating the, the risk because of the method of, of accounting, can you explain to me what the difference is between municipal accounting and accounting that is done, say, for a, a corporation and their, uh, you know, their tax filing? Yeah, I think on the Governmental Accounting Standards Board side, there is a different uh, governments, uh, you know, I, I think there is a recognition that they are different from corporations because they are going concerns and, uh, you know, there is a small like, unlikely that they will be out of business uh, going forward. So the Governmental Accounting Standards Board does allow uh, a different uh, set of assumptions to be used for uh, public pension accounting. And that has been the case. There is uh, significant discussion underway at the Governmental Accounting Standards Boards to look at that and uh, determine if that is still appropriate given market performance of the last decade. But I think that the accounting differential really recognizes the fundamental difference between governments and corporations. Well, is it exclusive to pensions or does it involve other kinds of general obligation bonds as well? Well, the um, Governmental Accounting Standards Board also, you know, covers uh, the annual financial statements or uh, financial audits that uh, governments provide. So there is a differential in accounting standard there, also recognizing some of the differences between uh, corporations and governments. And but if, it, if it is understated, and that was the testimony, I believe it was you or Mr. Carter, did, was there somebody that, that testified today that local, uh, you know, the there is sort of an understatement of the problem. Mr. Dr. Biggs, you did. Would you then answer my question? The standards used by the Governmental uh, Accounting Standards Board, or GASB, allow uh, states or municipalities to discount their liabilities at the expected rate of return of any assets they have set aside to fund their liabilities. So if they think their assets are going to return 8 percent, they can discount the liability at that. That applies mostly to pensions. It would apply in some limited cases to retiree health care. Uh, some states prefund their health care obligations. Most don't. Uh, so in, in, the, in the private sector, a, a private sector pension plan could discount its uh, pension liabilities at the rate of return or the yield on uh, corporate bonds, which is currently around 5.5 percent. So the effect of the, the differences in um, the discount rates is really very, very large between the private private sector and the public sector. Okay. Well, thank you for that explanation. I just have one remaining question. Uh, uh, Mr. Kerner, let me ask you this one. In my review for this hearing, there was a discussion about the fact that the Federal Reserve looks as if they are going to decrease their participation in, the, in, in purchases within the bond market. Um, do you have any sense as to what impact that is going to be, have on the interest rates and a prediction about how high those interest rates may go? Um, uh, yes, Mr. Congressman. I, that is really something that is outside my area. I am a State and local government analyst, and I uh, don't really have um, uh, an opinion on uh, these kind of larger macro issues. Okay. Is there anybody on the panel that does have a, uh, a feeling on that issue? Well, the consensus, uh, if you look at the Congressional Budget Office and really just about every other forecaster out there, is that interest rates will head upward. They are at extraordinarily low levels today. And assuming that we do see some sort of economic recovery, it is reasonable to expect that they will get to more normal levels. Thank you. Uh, and with that, I yield uh, the full committee ranking member, uh, Mr. Cummings, five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I want to thank our witnesses for your testimony. Um, Dr. Baker, uh, one of my concerns, and having been now in State Legislature for 15 years and been here on the Hill for 15 years, you see uh, a lot of times folks trying to deal with a problem as if that problem is going to last forever. And they deal with it, and then things get better. And I'm just, you know, when I listen to a lot of the discussion, I'm worried about uh, folks who, when the economy comes back, uh, will be, I mean, we try to make all you know these changes, and it will be hard to reverse it. You follow me? And I mean, is that one of your concerns too? Uh, 
Absolutely. And again, I, I was on the other side of this uh, argument uh, a few years back because I did feel that given price to earnings ratios in the stock market in the 90s, in particular when we had the bubble, that pension funds, both on the private and public side, were being hugely overoptimistic. Now we have a serious downturn. Um, much of the pension fund shortfall likely will go away when we get future year valuations because, of course, the market has recovered much of its lost ground. I am not saying it is going to go away 100 percent, but we are looking in many cases at funding periods that were very near the trough of the market. Now, there is averaging, so it is a little more complicated than that. But we are in many cases looking at funding periods that were, were near the trough of the market. The market has recovered much of its value. I don't have a crystal ball, so I can't tell you it will recover all of its value. But it is almost certainly going to be the case. They will look better simply from that recovery. And again, if we had the economy back on its feet, if we were back near 5 percent unemployment, we would be looking at a much better situation in general for State and local governments. So the idea that we are going to be in perpetual crisis, I can't rule that out. But I think that is going to be more determined by the situation of the macroeconomy than the finances of State and local governments themselves. Well, that, that leads me to my next question. Probably the most uh, poignant example of how politicians use pensions and public employees as their scapegoat is the battle that has transpired in Wisconsin on this issue. As a February 22, 2011 Huffington Post article explains, it says, while Governor Scott Walker has painted a dire picture of his State's pension obligations, Wisconsin's pension fund for public employees is among the Nation's strongest. According to a report by the nonpartisan Pew Center, the Pew report issued last year concluded that Wisconsin is a national leader in managing its long-term liabilities for both pension and retiree health care, end of quote. Dr. Baker, according to that same article, Governor Walker used his State's pension obligations to argue for a need to revoke collective bargaining rights of State employees. And I am just wondering if you had an opinion whether such a drastic step was necessary or was that an example of a scare tactic that, uh, that you have uh, discussed uh, in your uh, report uh, February 2011? entitled The Origins and Severity of Public Pension Crisis? Well, I won't claim to be an expert on, on either Wisconsin's funding or Governor Scott's motives, but I will say from what I know of its funding, it is very close to fully funded. They have been very responsible. And I will point out that, again, just to, to be as clear as I can here, pension is part of the overall compensation. There have been analyses specifically of Wisconsin's uh, compensation packages. Uh, uh, Jeff Keefe at Rutgers University looked at it and found that public sector workers receive somewhat less total compensation than comparably educated, experienced private sector employees. If you are to cut the pensions in some way, you can no doubt in the short term save some money, but workers expect comparable pay. If you are reducing public sector compensation, you could either say, well, maybe we won't get as good workers in the future, or you know, alternatively, maybe you will have to make that up in other pay. And again, the, the, the defined benefit is very important. Workers value that certainty. And again, this gets back to this issue Andrew was raising, that States can bear the risk. If you have a downturn and there's two, three, four years where the market is down, where things look bad, States can get through that risk as long as they have in general been responsible. If you or I retire and the stock market is down, we are out of luck. There is nothing we could do about that. So by virtue of taking that risk, that is a very big benefit for workers that they are willing to give up other compensation for. We lose that if we end defined benefit plans. Well, one of the things that, you know, when you talk to workers, um, particularly ones in, in my district, they tell me that when they were voting for various during negotiations, union negotiations, that they took less pay because they were worried about the benefits when they retired. It is very common. Public sector workers have lower pay by almost every measure than private sector workers, straight wages, but they have somewhat better pensions and health care benefits. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen's time has expired. And with that, uh, I recognize the full committee chairman, Mr. Issa of California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this important hearing. Uh, Dr. Biggs, uh, we have uh, a constant debate, it seems, on public and private sector uh, activities, union, non-union. The ranking member uh, went on quite a bit, uh, acting as though it is uh, scapegoats. Don't we have basically a difference between unionized private sector workers and public workers, particularly in that uh, 
in the private sector, a unionized worker is in Social Security, well, in the public sector, at all the State levels, virtually, they are in a system that, that has their high pay opted out of Social Security and often Medicare, which means they are out of a system and into their own system, uh, which is not fully paid for. And uh, as I think Dr. Baker made very clear, they have this safety net, which is current overseers, the elected officials and or their representatives, can make a deal that ultimately they know cannot be kept in the future without unrealistic expectations of growth in their, in their bonds. Typically in California, they were assuming a growth that you could not find in any index, but you could find it for a short time in PERS and STRS. Would you like to give us a little insight into that part of, of the problem we are dealing with on these pensions? Well, this, I think, is an important issue, because one question of how you resolve some of these, these pension financing issues comes down to your, your perceptions of, of how well or how poorly paid public sector employees are. You are right that many public sector employees don't participate in Social Security, and that is sometimes pointed out as if they are losing something in that regard. And I don't want to downplay the important protections that Social Security provides, but as a general deal, public sector pensions are a far better deal for them. Uh, Social Security would pay them, on average, a rate of return around 2 percent on their contributions. Um, under the typical public sector pension, they are effectively guaranteed a rate of return of around 8 percent. Compound that over your full career, and it is an enormous difference. You also tend to get in the in the, the state and local sector retiree health care, which can be very generous, and often that's not included in, in the private sector. Uh, uh, Congressman Cummings was just mentioning uh, employees in Wisconsin. I know uh, Milwaukee teachers, for instance, receive retiree health care that's worth around 20 percent of their pay. The sort of pay studies we've heard about today saying that uh, state and local employees are underpaid, it doesn't include retiree health care. It also tends to undercount the the pension benefits they get. So we want to get a good feel for where things stand. We, we have to compete for workers with the private sector. If you are in, in any low, low level of government, you don't want to underpay people, but it, it, you, it takes careful analysis to, to be able to tell whether they are being fairly paid or not. One, I guess to, to touch on your, your last point, the, the, the assumptions that go in, into the, the pension financing, things like this, I have focused on the assumed rate of return, and that is the most important one. There are many other things that can be jimmied around. Illinois had some problems where they would cut benefits for workers that haven't even been hired yet and book those savings today. Um, there's been examples in Washington State where their actuary said, you have to better account for the longer work lives of people, and the, and the board said, no, we're not going to do it. Well, uh, and I'm going to cut you off. I apologize. It, but you're, it's a good train of thought, and certainly in San Diego we have a scandal where that, that has been well codified in, in criminal prosecutions. Dr. Baker, I, I saw you startled when I, when I talked about the unrealistic expectations of the growth in PERS and STRS and so on. Now, I, I heard you say earlier with the ranking member that, well, the markets have come back. But isn't it true that if you were broadly invested, you, in fact, over the last three years had effectively net zero? And net zero is 24 percent compounded less than the anticipated amount that these these contributions were based on. Can you sit here today saying that anyone on this side of the aisle should have confidence in these uh, retirement plans if they assume 8 percent growth rather than, uh, let's just say, inflation plus 1 or 2? I don't think there has been anyone who has been more critical of overly optimistic returns in the stock market than I am, and I base that on price-to-earnings ratios. They were very high in the 90s. They were still somewhat high in the last decade. They have fallen a great deal. Future returns depend on current price-to-earnings ratios. Now that the price-to-earnings ratio is considerably lower, if you look out over a 20, 30-year horizon, then yes, I could look to your side of the aisle and say, yes, I think those returns are very reasonable, and I have done the arithmetic. Okay. Well, uh, I, I hope you are right. Uh, Let us uh, let's do another half of this. Dr. Biggs, back to you for a second. Uh, we have historically low interest rates today. We have a huge ballooning Federal deficit, but my own State of California and many others have built up a lot of debt. What happens if we return to, if you will, somewhere between where we are today and where we were in the 70s? What happens to both the Federal and the State's ability to meet pension obligations? We have the, the Federal budget and, to a degree, State budgets have benefited uh, from the fact that our 
uh, financing crisis, our budget problems have coincided with, with significant financial problems overseas, which has pushed capital from, from foreign countries into the U.S., and that has helped keep our interest rates low. So we have been very sort of advantaged by virtue of that. If interest rates start rising back to normal levels or if they go even further, uh, if, if markets are not convinced of our ability to get on top of our deficits, then all of this, the, the, this process starts cascading and it happens much, much sooner sooner than we would otherwise uh, anticipate. The, the history of financial crises, whether you are talking about currency crises, uh, crises, banking crises, is they can continue going on normal, but when they happen, they happen very, very quickly. So I think it is very good and we are very lucky to have low interest rates today. We should not be complacent because of that. Thank you. Yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we will now recognize Ms. Maloney for five minutes. First of all, I want to thank uh, the Chairman for holding this and ranking member. And uh, we are going to the floor shortly on a budget vote um, to, to uh, the continuing resolution. And, and in the uh, uh, budget proposals that have come forward for fiscal year 2012, um, the, practically every 42 States have proposed to spend less on education and health care than they spent in 2008 after inflation. And States are proposing uh, these cuts despite the fact that the costs associated with their services will be higher. So given uh, that backdrop, I would like to ask Mr. Baker, why is it important at this time not to cut Federal funding for State and local governments? Well, again, I would say there's two reasons here. Um, one, perhaps the more important, is the macroeconomic reason that at this point uh, the Federal deficit is supporting the economy. If we were to radically roll back the Federal deficit in 2011, we would see less demand. I don't know of any story that I could tell whereby if we cut back spending, lay off public employees, we are going to see uh, retail stores, hospitals, whoever it might be, go out and hire more workers. I don't know a story of the economy that works like that, at least not when you are in the middle of a downturn. So the macroeconomic picture is very important. The other part of the story is, obviously, these, many of these programs have the character of investment. We are talking about education. If our kids don't get adequate education because we have one, two, three years of economic slump, they are not going to be able to make that up. If we don't, uh, some of the cuts are in uh, regulatory programs like the Securities and Exchange Commission. I would think people would be very sensitive to that, recognizing that we clearly had problems of inadequate regulation. We were talking about fraud in the public sector or at least questionable accounting. There clearly was a serious rash of that in the private sector as well. I would think that Congress would be very sensitive to that. So I think we could pay a big price for it. Well, well isn't it true that uh, proposed GOP cuts to Federal funding for State and local governments will force some States to impose higher taxes? and to cut vital public services, actions that will, will hinder economic growth? Uh, could you comment on that? Well, most States in the country are facing serious budget shortfalls, and they are making uh, cutbacks in uh, a wide range of areas, and many of them are raising taxes as well. One could argue as to how vital those are, but you know, clearly they are making important cutbacks. And I think um, most, uh, e e even the governors that have been aggressive in supporting those cutbacks, I think regret many of them in the sense that they feel they are cutting back services that have real merit. And again, this is not the time I would think that you would want to see cutbacks in programs that say provide health care for the poor, because there are more poor now, and it is very hard to argue that they could simply go out and get a job when we have close to 25 million people unemployed or underemployed. And, and, Mr. Baker, how will State and local governments balance their budgets without this uh, much-needed Federal funding? Uh, they, 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 many States have budget gaps that are huge, including my own State and including the great State of California and others. So, so how in the world are they going to balance their budgets? Well, nearly every State has requirements that they balance the budget, and there is always some room around that. But in, in most States, this will mean serious cutbacks in spending and or increase in taxes, which, again, uh, this is not the sort of thing you want in the middle of a downturn. If we were in a situation where the economy were at normal levels of output, we're operating near 5 percent unemployment, you could say, okay, fine, you know, the private sector will pick up the gap. But I don't think you credibly can tell that story given where the economy is today. Well, I want to thank you for your testimony and just conclude by saying that State and local governments have eliminated 426,000 jobs since August. Um, 2008, and State budget cuts have eliminated additional jobs in the private sector. And, uh, in fact, at least 13 of 42 States who have released budget proposals for fiscal year 2012 have proposed layoffs uh, 
uh, and cuts in pay and benefits for public workers, and eight States have proposed measures such as extending expiring tax surcharges, repealing tax credits or deductions, and broadening the base of some taxes, and raising rates. And we have been called for a vote on that sort of depressing note. <laughs> Thank you all for your testimony and for being here today. Thank you. Thank you for yielding back. And with that, I recognize Mr. Ross for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will try to be brief. Uh, you know, I am trying to get my hands around this. And, and it appears as though even though we have had a reduction in workforces both federally, uh, statewide and on municipalities, there still exists an unfunded mandate out there, or an unfunded liability out there, excuse me, uh, with regard to the defined pension plans. And, and Ms. Printing, what I am trying to understand is, is, is at some point, as a, as a financial uh, rating organization, you, you have to look at these pension plans and say it is too good to be true. I mean, you have to look at the investments that they are making in order to fund these, correct? We, when we are analyzing pension, we do include pension in our review. It is part of our criteria and has been. We look at uh, all of the underlying assumptions. We look at the liabilities, and it is factored to, into our rating. You will see a differential. Uh, for instance, Utah is a AAA-rated state, and they have very proactively managed those liabilities and looked at their assumptions. And so you you do see us factoring in. Uh, but they've looked at it and made adjustments at, from moving away from defined benefit plans. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Uh, that's part of the solution uh, in Utah, but that's not uh, you know universal across governments. Most of the pension plans do. Uh, remain defined benefit. In, in your statement, you say, in general, we believe worst case scenarios regarding pensions will likely occur only if governments are unwilling or unable or unwilling to use their powers of adjustment. What would you recommend to be their powers of adjustment in order to avoid the worst case scenarios? Yeah, I don't think we would have a recommendation on what the power of adjustment is, but I think that history has shown that they have the ability to uh, either manage the liability side of the equation or um, increase uh, contributions or make other adjustments uh, to the overall program and plan. So those are really policy choices that each individual State or local government and will move, make. Moving from a defined benefit plan to a contribution plan would be a step in the right direction. Would you not agree? Uh, I think that we would say that those are, again, policy decisions that each government uh, is going to make on and will look at the overall impact on the liabilities. But, but from your perspective, from your financial rating perspective, it would be more advantageous to a better rating if it was a, a, a contribution plan. I think proactively managing the liability is certainly very positive, and making a strong commitment to funding the pensions has historically been consistent with uh, you know, a high rating level. Uh, Mr. Curter, I want to go to you for just one quick second, because uh, you also are in the financial rating business. Now, if, as the title in, uh, of, of today's hearing uh, implies bailouts on public and private programs, if there were ever to be a bailout, would that not be an assumption, then, that a financial rating service would have to take into consideration when giving a rating? I mean, once the precedent is set? Um, <clears throat> Yeah, our ratings don't assume that the Federal Government will bail out States. We do assume that the but assume, uh, uh, let's assume that it is done, uh, that a bailout is actually done. Uh, well, what we do consider is that the Federal Government has, uh, has always and by law assumes the cost of emergency response in the event of natural disasters and other uh, man-made events, um, and we do build that into our ratings. Since the, um, uh, the role of the Federal Government in providing bailout, if a State were to um, uh, need assistance, is uncertain, we don't uh, embed that in our ratings uh, because it, we don't uh, have enough precedent to reliably know that investors could depend on that. But it would seem, seem to me, though, that once the precedent is set, then it would have to be considered as a potential assumption in making your ratings. Uh, considered, uh, I mean, a precedent is, um, is situationally based and, you know, may be a result of particular circumstances that may not be something we could rely on uh, in the future. Uh, Dr. Biggs, one thing real quickly. Um, uh, Mr. Curter points out that we do not expect any States to default on their bond obligations in the next 12 to 18 months. Do you agree or disagree with that statement and why? I think I, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to overstate my competence in this area because it really depends on State-by-State -state knowledge. And it is also extremely difficult to predict low price probability events. If mm -hmm. we had defaults every year, we would have very good models for knowing what leads to a default. At this point, they are so infrequent, it is hard to say. So I think I would agree, but it is certainly not something I would be complacent about. Okay. And, and Senator, uh, last question. Given the bad results of many revenue bond projects, uh, should, should such highly risky projects benefit from tax exemption? 
Pardon me? Uh, on, on municipal bonds. If, if, should, should we continue to have tax-exempt municipal bonds, or should Congress come into play and say, hey, wait a second, these things are so risky, they are such a high rate of default, we are incentivizing the sale of them with tax exemption. Should we as Congress step back and say, you know what, maybe we should readdress the tax-exempt status of these things? You know, I, I think that is a fairly that's a good question. I think the challenge we have more with our municipality is, is having them overextend themselves because of the free um, ability of credit. And we are addressing that in our State um, uh, ourselves, trying to make sure that, that our, our cities aren't uh, overextending themselves. And we, we end up being the catch-all for them. So uh, that is something to consider. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. And with that, I am going to recognize the Vice Chair, Mr. Genta from New Hampshire, for two minutes, and then Mr. Walsh for three and a half or four minutes, depending on the time for the votes on the floor. Mr. Genta. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here. I will be very brief because we do have to go over to vote. Uh, but a question for uh, Dr. Baker. Uh, first of all, do you feel, generally speaking, that the Federal Government should be backing um, you know, the, the, the loans that States are, are asking for and demanding for, for, the, for their borrowing? I am afraid I am not sure exactly which loans you are referring to. Well, the, the Build America Bonds Program. Oh, oh I am sorry. Um, I think a program like that is a reasonable program. You know, could one construct different contours for it? Sure. But I think given the that where we are in the economy, I think it does make sense for the Federal Government to encourage States to engage in uh, infrastructure spending stimulus of different types. We do need to boost the economy. And for the edification of the committee, where, what is your opinion as to where the Federal Government gets that money from? Well, given that we are in a downturn right now, that would mean borrowing. I don't think there is any doubt about it. If you were to raise taxes, it would be, be self-defeating. Okay. So the Federal Government is borrowing money to give to States so they could borrow to pay whatever obligations they have. I, I hope that they are not doing it for um, you know, I, I would ex accept that it would be capital-based projects and things of that nature, but I have seen some states uh, borrow to pay you know, their operating costs, which is obviously not a good thing to do, but I have seen it. Um, I guess my question would be, uh, this Build America Bonds program um, is expiring, correct? Does, right. does that have a negative or a positive effect on, from a rating agency perspective uh, for the states that are using that that have used that program. Did you want me to answer that sure, question? Yeah. Um, if they reduce their borrowing, you know, if they're no longer borrowing because the program's not there, I'd imagine it would be pretty much neutral. Yeah, I mean, okay. Would would Ms. Prunty or Mr. Curter agree with that, or is there an effect now that this program is lapsing? Yeah, the Build the Build America Bond program has um, uh, the expiration has. Uh, hit the end of the year. So I think that the Build America Bond Program was helpful in uh, expanding the market for uh, municipal bonds, uh, but it wasn't a direct credit issue for State and local governments. Okay. Thank you. With that, I recognize Mr. Walsh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Biggs, I was going to ask you a few questions about my home state of Illinois, but we have got to vote, so I won't. Let me just ask you one quick big picture question. It has been suggested by the other side, I think, uh, that government spending cuts, um, maybe even cutting some public sector jobs at the State and local level, uh, might do some harm to the economy, might do some harm to the private sector economy. Just give me your view. Does that make sense to you? There has actually been a, a range of studies that have been done by international organizations like the IMF, the World Bank, the OECD, that have looked at countries that have successfully balanced their budgets. Those, you know, there are some who tried and failed, some who tried and succeeded. The countries that, that tried to balance their budgets and succeeded in reducing deficits and debt did it principally on the spending side. Uh, I, I guess it is around 85 percent on average spending, only around 15 percent tax increases. And those uh, countries tended to to focus on reductions in transfer spending and reductions in what is called the government wage bill, which is the size and pay of the, the government workforce. One thing that these studies have found, and there is some debate, but the worst case they found was that these sort of steps tend to be neutral with regard to the economy. Tax increases they found tended to hurt the growth of the economy. Some studies have found that these steps could even improve economic growth because of the confidence factor they build in. The individuals and businesses and financial markets see the government 
government getting on top of these tough problems. And even if they are long-term solutions, they feel better today, and that helps get the economy going again. Great. Thank you. Just one other quick question. Senator Lillenquist, what is one takeaway? What can the rest of the country learn about Utah, if you can bestow one, one lesson on all of us? I think the lesson would be that reality is not negotiable. If you can look forward and see what we are bearing as a State, which is what we did on pension problems, it didn't pass the smell test. We looked at every scenario, and that was 95 percent of the battle as we went person by person in our legislature and sat down with them and showed them the data. We, have, we are bearing far more risk than we ever dreamed, and, and I think that that is um, that is the message that reality is not negotiable. You have to do right. something. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I appreciate the gentleman yielding back, and uh, I certainly appreciate the testimony today. Um, uh, Mr. Carter, in particular, thank you for being forthcoming and uh, your analysis. That is very helpful, and we wanted to have that from the credit rating agencies. Uh, I appreciate everybody taking the time to be here, to, to travel to Washington. I know it is not easy to go before a committee like this, but thankfully it was uh, uh, brief in comparison to some other hearings because we have been called to the floor for votes. certainly appreciate your analysis. Uh, this is certainly an ongoing series, and we want to have feedback on uh, what is necessary for us to have accurate transparency and disclosure in the marketplace so that uh, actually those participating, those lending money to States will have the transparency they need to actually make an accurate decision and price risk. Uh, that was uh, obviously the center part of this hearing. We certainly appreciate your testimony. We understand there is a challenge out there, uh, the magnitude of which there has been a little debate, but there is uh, uh, a problem, and we have to tackle that. So thank you for your testimony. And this meeting is now adjourned.